what I'm talking about. Verse 4 is our thesis verse for the message this morning. The B portion says the following, Then the fugitive shall be taken into the city, underline these words, and given a place, and shall remain with them. Then the fugitive shall be taken into the city, and given a place, and shall remain with them. Brothers and sisters, friends and guests, with the help of your prayers and under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, I want to preach to you briefly this morning on the subject of don't build a wall, build a city. Don't build a wall, build a city. Providence, what a unique and powerful message is delivered to you and I in the 20th chapter of Joshua. The details of this chapter are a repeat of details that God offered in Deuteronomy regarding the cities of refuge. Here, at the time this information is provided, the invasion of Canaan is nearly complete. The conquest of the land that God had promised to the Israelites' ancestor Abraham way back in the 12th chapter of Genesis is now coming to fruition. It is both interesting and makes perfect sense that now, as they are about to receive their inheritance and inhabit their promised land, only now will they receive instructions on how to deal with each other when common problems arise between them. You see, when they were in bondage and in Egypt, they shared a common struggle and they had a common enemy. When they were wandering through the wilderness, they shared a common struggle, and they had a common enemy. When they were taking Jericho and preparing to invade all of Canaan from there, they shared a common struggle, and they had a common enemy. But once Canaan was theirs, struggle against a common enemy decreased, which means the potential for struggle within the family increased. This is a biblical teaching you do not want to miss, my friends. When we have a common enemy, we tend to work together. But when that enemy is defeated and a time of prosperity is upon us, the war, the violence, the preparation for battle, the evil that was on the inside of us that made us so appropriate during the war, that evil doesn't go anywhere. That evil, that anger, that frustration, that preparation for violence, it sits idly within our spirits, and it is ready at a moment's notice to be turned on the people closest to us, to be turned against our own family. The children of Israel were defeating their common enemy. For all intents and purposes, they were all family, and when the violence against the common enemy was no longer needed, the violence within the family laid in wait to be taken out at any moment. And so this is a very interesting teaching here within the book of Joshua because it teaches us that the Lord spoke to Joshua here in the first verse telling him to provide a remedy for what the Lord knew was about to be a growing problem. Such a simple law that God enacted. And on the surface, it appears that God is being quite merciful and overly gracious. Simply stated, the law went like this. Anyone who killed another person, when the intent of the killing was in question, that person could flee to a city of refuge. These Israelites, you have to remember, were raised under a Levitical law teaching of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So murder, killing anyone, was to be responded to with more murder because violence begets violence. If you killed someone else, then their family had the right to kill you. To kill was to, in effect, sign your own death warrant because, as the Bible says, the avenger of blood was going to be coming for you. Yet here in the 20th chapter of Joshua, God repeats to the children of Israel that if the killing wasn't murder but was manslaughter, if the intent could be questioned, then the killer could flee. To a city of refuge. God made a way for the guilty party to flee away from the avenger of blood. God made a way for the guilty party to escape 
from punishment, to retreat from responsibility, to evade their death sentence, and to a city of refuge they could run. To the city of refuge. They, they could find protection under the elders of the city. Truthfully, brothers and sisters, it is the case that many of us see in this story of cities of refuge, we see in this story a picture of Jesus Christ. So guilty are you and I of our intentional and our unintentional sin. So, so knowledgeable are we of what we do wrong and the fact that we have unintentionally done things against the will of God that we run to the cross fleeing to Jesus as our eternal city of refuge because only in the city with Christ, in the kingdom of God, can we be fully absolved from our sins and be redeemed under his grace. The cities of refuge have such an important place in the biblical teachings of how you and I ought to treat one another. However, when you read the story about the cities of refuge, there's a very important question that you must ask yourself, and that question is this. Why did God need cities of refuge in the first place? Ultimately, when you read the story closely, you'll notice that God's law was actually for there to be a trial by the elders and the congregation to determine the intent of the murderer. And only after such a trial occurred and a determination was made on intent could any punishment be meted out. For the rest of God's law, you'll recall that he gave to the people. He told them the law and simply expected them to follow it. So why didn't God simply say, if a murder occurs, wait for the trial and then we'll deal with the punishment afterwards? Why did God need to build cities of refuge? This is the important question that the text begs of us. What, what made this particular law in all of Deuteronomy, in all of Numbers, in all of Leviticus, what made this particular law so special, so unique, and so different? What was it about this law where the expectations were different? Why did we need to build cities of refuge? It could be because God was so untrusting of the people's willingness to obey his instruction that he commanded an alternative to obedience to be built so that the killer could have a place of refuge. Do you know what this means? This means that the story and the teachings about the cities of refuge are teachings that are less about the grace that is afforded to the killer. It's less about the refuge for the one who has been murdered. It, it is less about protection for the one who has done wrong. And it is more an indictment of the thirst for vengeance for those who have been wronged. So great was their passion for vengeance, so insatiable was their need for violence, so desirable was their anger for blood, so hungry were they to make others feel the way that they had been feeling, that God knew he couldn't trust them to wait for a trial. God knew that once vengeance got in the human, once anger overtook the person, that they would ignore God's teaching. So God had to construct cities of refuge where the sinner could be protected from vengeance of the person who had been done wrong. Stay with me here, this is important. The teaching of this text is that God is on the side of protecting sinners. He's creating space between the offended party and the offender to allow sufficient enough time for the gathering of information so that an appropriate response can be had before the bloodthirsty person's need for vengeance causes a person to hastily commit a sinful act. I hope you see where I'm going with this. God has commanded the buildings of city of refuge because God in this text is standing against blind rage. He is standing against your pressure rising from vengeance. He is standing against the evil that manifests within us whenever we feel wrong. God is against the war that we fight on the outside that comes from the evil that is on the inside that is ready at a moment's notice to pop off if somebody wrongs us. In the text, verse three tells us that it is the killer, the one who has killed someone else. It is the killer who can flee to a city of refuge. The killer, the one who killed you with an unkind word. The killer, the one who dared speak your name outside of its proper context. The killer, 
the one who disregarded your feelings and disrespected your person, the killer, the one who killed your relationship, who ruined your family, who selfishly dragged your name through the mud, the killer, the one who poisoned you with their ways, who drowned you with their evil, who suffocated you with their speech, who hung you with their lies, who crucified you with their carelessness, who hit you with their hate, the killer could flee to a city of refuge. And in response to the killer, the one who is murdering others around you, the one who is harming those you love, the one who's speaking evil to those you care about, the one who is mistreating others who can't defend themselves, in response to the killer, God says you may flee to a city of refuge. If you're like me, when the killer enters your space or enters your idea or your mind, the evil begins to rise up in you. The grace is nowhere to be found in the building. Your eyes are red with vengeance. Your tongue is sharp with salt. Today, you will feel like I felt. You will cry the way I've cried. You will suffer the way I suffered. And in that moment, you and I get prepared to respond to the killers around us, the killers on our jobs, the killers in our own families. We get prepared to defend ourselves from the evil that is around us, to punish those around us. We've got slick tongues. We've got witty minds. We've got fancy ways of harming other people. We know what to say to make people feel small. We know how to exact our revenge. We know how to hit them where it hurts. We are the ones who have been wronged. I didn't start it. You started it, but you best believe I'm about to finish it. You are going to learn today that you messed with the wrong one. You hurt the wrong family. You disrespected the wrong child, and today, vengeance shall be mine, and, and I'm just about to speak. I'm just about to tell you what's on my mind. I'm just about to post something evil on Facebook. Just as I'm about to strike you, mistreat you, key your car, call your job, or send a message to your spouse and punish you. God says, wait. And God tells the murderous one, you may flee. You, the killer, can find protection. Wait a minute, God, this doesn't make any sense to me. You're going to give them protection. You're going to allow them to flee. You are caring for the criminal. You're being merciful to the maniacal. You're being compassionate to the evil. How is this possible, God? How, as verse 3 says, can there be refuge for the killer? How there can be refuge away from me for the avenger of blood? How, as verse 4 says, can they be given a place? Can they have a city, a place of refuge, a place of respite, a place when they have done so much evil and they have done so much wrong, why did they get a place to be protected? This is where this particular text, this particular book of the Bible challenges your concept of faith. This is where we find out if you're walking with God or walking with yourself. When God commissioned Joshua in the first chapter of the book, he told him, Joshua, just as I was with Moses, so shall I be with you. Be strong and courageous. And when you read this book and you study this Bible and you serve this God, will you have the courage to trust God's ways? Will you have the strength to not exact your own vengeance? Will you have the strength and courage to provide a city of refuge? In so doing, the simple message of this sermon is the following. God builds cities of refuge because vengeance is not for you. We desire vengeance in so many ways and in so many circumstances. How many times, don't raise your hands, how many times in your thoughts, in your own mind, have you wanted vengeance against someone you viewed as evil for the wrong they've done? How many times have you vengefully spoken poorly to others who first spoke poorly to you? How many times when you feel disrespected did you vengefully disrespect your neighbor? How many times when there was seemingly no evil to fight out there and you knew you had hell bubbling up on the inside of you, did you take it out on your own spouse, take it out on your own children, take it out on your own family? Brothers and sisters, vengeance is not for you. God builds a city not simply to protect the murdering people. God builds a city not simply to protect the murderers, but God builds a city to save you from yourself. Because God knows that once you get into the revenge business, in a moment's notice, evil will pass through your lips, hate will rise in your heart, and the devil will have complete control of who you are. 
God builds a city of refuge because without it, you and I will completely lose control. We will be unable to see the goodness of God over our focus on evil of humanity. We will take on the evil of our enemy, the evil of our oppressors, and the wickedness of their corruption. God builds cities of refuge to save me from me. Thank you, God for building a city so that I would not become the worst version of myself. Thank you, God, that for building a city of refuge so I would not engage in retaliatory behavior so that my speech would not harm others the way I've been harmed. Thank you, God, for building a city so that I could save myself from a chastising judgment, a doomed fate of anger, and the frustrating world of working for the devil rather than serving the Lord. Thank you, God, for building a city so that I could see mercy in action, so that I could train myself in self-control, so that I can trust you, God, for justice and righteousness on my behalf. Thank you for building a city. And so it is that God told Joshua to tell the people to obey God and build a city rather than being the type of leader who would disobey God and tell his people to build a wall. The problem with walls, brothers and sisters, is that walls are exclusionary. Walls are intended to keep people out, but if you don't pay attention, the purpose of a wall is more intended to trap people in. Did you know it is in our nature as a human race to build walls to solve our problems? All you need do is look back through the annals of history and you'll see that humans have always been building walls and the building of walls has never worked. We build walls in the ground such as the wall built in Hungary to protect the border of Croatia, and the wall didn't work. The wall built in Israel to protect the border of Egypt, and the wall didn't work. The wall built in the West Bank to protect Jerusalem from the Palestinians, and the wall didn't work. The wall built in Belfast to protect the Catholics from the priest, and the wall Protestants, and the wall didn't work. The wall built in Berlin to separate the East Germans from the West Germans, and the wall didn't work. The Great Wall built in China to protect the Ming Dynasty from the Qing Dynasty, and the Qing Dynasty took over just after it was built because the wall didn't work. The wall built on MLK to keep black people on one side and white people on the other side, and the wall didn't work. And now we want to build a wall in America to separate Mexico from the United States. And the wall won't work. History has taught us that building walls to solve our problems has never worked. But when you're not listening to God, you're like a child who doesn't listen to the teacher. And so you keep repeating the same costly mistakes over and over and over again, and thus you keep repeating the same grade. But brothers and sisters, I do not want you to get surprised by the great physical walls we build on the outside in this world to separate us from people we don't like. Because the physical walls we build on the outside are simply stone and mortar representations of the internal walls we build around our hearts to separate our love away from the people we don't want to love. We can't speak kindly to our neighbors, so we build a wall. We can't be in the same room with a family member, so we build a wall. We can't stop from getting into a fight with them just because I saw them in my presence. And so we build a wall. I can't even hear God's call for grace and mercy because I've built a wall. My eyes get red with vengeance. My anger boils up in me. I can't bear to see you on the TV, so I got to turn it off because I've built a wall. Well, Providence, I want you to know this morning, I read somewhere about a God who told me in this life not to build walls, but to build a city. Build a large and important municipality in your life where the people in your life who have wronged you can go and receive the services of the city called grace and mercy. The same services in the city that you know you need every day. My God told me don't build a wall, but build a city where where people are not excluded, but all of us sinners are included. My God told me don't build a wall, but build a city where, where people know that they can get another chance, that forgiveness 
forgiveness is available, where grace is the governor, where mercy is the mayor, and on the city council sits love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Because my God told me, don't build a wall, but build a city. Build a city of refuge in my heart, a city of refuge in my church, a city of refuge in my community, a city of refuge on my job, in my family, with my friends, around my enemies, for my children, a city of refuge for the helplessness, for the homelessness, for the hopelessness, for the sinfulness, for the worrisomeness. Build a city of refuge. And if I build a city of refuge for you, if I build a city of refuge for somebody else, then God is going to build a city for me, a city called heaven that I can make it into when I close my eyes on this side, a city called heaven where God will receive me, God will love me, God will keep me, God will hold me. Can I make it into the city called heaven? Yes. Don't build a wall. Build a city. God bless you, Providence.